Welcome to the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast, a show dedicated to modern learning and development with your hosts, Daniel Mendonca and Scott Babcock. It's podcast day. Welcome to the show. This is If You Build It, Will They Learn. I'm Scott Babcock. I'm here with your co-host, Daniel Mendonca. Daniel, we've been off the mics for a little while. Uh, we had a little holiday special. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. How are you doing in the new year? I'm doing well. New Year's off to a great... I mean, it's off to a start, that's for sure. Um, it's it's uh, <laughs> For me, it's been great, but I'm happy to be back. I know, Scott, you and I were nerding out uh, last night about the fact we're back on the mics, and that was, that was fun. So we have you know these fancy... Um, our producer, Sabrina, got us a Christmas gift. Fancy... Uh, we'll have to post a picture. Fancy, sh- I'm recording a podcast mugs with our logo on it. So pretty, uh, pretty excited about that. Yeah, it was nice, a nice little surprise. She kept it. Uh, she just got our mailing addresses and, and then told us something was on the way. And so that was kind of fun to, uh, to, to have arrive. And I'm pretty excited to drink coffee with you uh, at least once a week going forward here in the not so distant future. Uh, today, though, we're going to do a little bit of uh, a, just kind of a twist. Uh, we did our holiday show, which was fun. Today, we want to talk a little bit about CES, which happened last week, and talk through some of our experience there. We'll talk about what CES is uh, and give you some rundown on, on why Halite participates and what we hope to get out of those sessions. So you, you have some context around where we're coming from, and we'll talk about what we learned throughout the virtual event. So um, that's our topic. For today, I'm pretty excited to dive in with you on that, and probably a little short, shorter episode. And then uh, we will announce uh, at the end of the show. Stay with us. We'll announce our start date for season two of the podcast coming up here shortly. All right. So if we're going to sit and talk CES, we probably should tell a few folks about what that is. I know not everyone who listens to the podcast maybe is familiar, but uh, CES is the Consumer Electronics. That's that's a tough word for me to say. I'm going to try that again. It is the Consumer Electronics Show, um, and it is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, show related to sort of the manufacture and retail of consumer electronics. Um, It happens every year at the beginning of the year in January, and it takes place normally in a a uh, non-upside-down world that we live in, uh, in Las Vegas. And it's 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 huge. So I think they they announced that normally during a live year, it's around 170,000 or 180,000 people come from all around the world, representing uh, manufacturers as well as retailers, um, marketing agencies, uh, learning and development companies, perhaps, uh, and a number of others uh, that are all working together to try to figure out what the new releases are for the year, what's the strategy going forward. What products are retailers going to sell? Um, but it's a really fun event because there's a lot around uh, innovation, ingenuity, new launches, new technologies. Um, and normally there's around 4,000 different uh, manufacturers that come to this event to do uh, to exhibit uh, what's coming up for them in the new year. Um, and, and again, they represent everything from software technologies to drones to home theater and television, automotive, uh, mobility solutions, uh, and anything in between and, and around. So um, perhaps, Daniel, just a, a little bit of insight on why did Halite, uh comes to the event, what we hope to accomplish when we're there, um, and what some of our goals and outcomes are. Yeah, Halite as a whole, we've mentioned this before. I mean, our core business is learning and development and training and, and learning management systems, obviously, you know, pretty close to the theme of the podcast. Um, but we, a, a division of our, our company or, or part of it really spends a lot of time working in the retail space. Uh, we work a lot with consumer electronics brands. So of our retail brands, uh, probably 65 to 75% of them are uh, consumer electronics brands. So um, I know myself as a um, director of sales, I can go to CES and accomplish like two to three months worth of, of strategy, planning meetings, uh, you know, new lead generation conversations um, in about five days. Um, it's tiring, but but there's there is no other time of year where seventy five or percent of your customers are in the same city uh, for the same amount of time with the same goals and intentions. Everybody there is to is is there to do business, uh, to to plan, to strategize. So um, every year, Halet has a larger and larger presence. Um, I know the first the first year was just myself, um, our president, and and one other. A sales team member who went and then it was five the next year and then it was six and then i think the last year i think we had eight or nine uh who were there last year scott and i and we had planned on having a much larger team this year and uh 
you know, there were some disappointed minds, but we all got to explore the, you know, the virtual CES environment, which we'll, we'll dive into. One thing I do want to add to what you said earlier, Scott, the, it, it is, I think, believe the third largest trade show in the world. Uh, and it is the largest in, in consumer um, retail in the world. And the sheer, everybody I feel like has gone to a, a trade show or been in Vegas when there's something going on like that. And you see conference halls or, uh, you know, conference, uh, conference centers being used or whatever that is. CES uses 93%. I looked up the stat this morning to make sure I was accurate. 93% of all conference show floor space in the city of Las Vegas. On the strip, they use almost every single square foot there is. It takes a month to set it up and about two weeks to take it down. And it's just, it's almost like a wonder of the world. It's its pretty crazy to see how many people um, are there. And it's its a, it's a super fun week and I, I will get into this, but sad not, uh, not being there and kicking off my year uh, in person. So... Um, on that note, yeah, I would. Um, those are one. Those are fun stats. We all know I love a good a good number when it gets thrown around. Um, but I mean, the sheer scale of it is overwhelming. I, so I went to my first one uh, live this last year, and you know, I, I guess if you're not familiar with trade shows, or maybe you've been to maybe ATD or some of these others, uh, the normal large booth at a lot of those is maybe forty by forty, sixty by sixty. Um, I think last year, uh, and don't hold me to this number. I did not look it up. Uh, the LG booth was something around 30 or 40,000 square feet, um, of, of just space. That was their booth, one booth. Um, and so, and it, it, it's an amazing, like cascading waterfall room of TVs that are above your head and playing these like synchronous, uh, scenes and stuff, which is, you know, and that's just one booth. I mean, the, everything there was amazing. Um, and yeah, to your point that it, it, it sprawls the strip, it stra- sprawls the convention center. Um, and you can't, you can't even go to the trade show and see everything in a single thing. So if you're, if you're used to your local home and garden show or something that's in your regional expo hall or whatever, um, uh, just multiply that times, whatever, uh, that would span your entire city and you have to walk and there's trams that take you everywhere. So that part is just, that is an experience in and of itself. That's really hard to replicate in a virtual world. I was very sad we didn't get to go. Plus just, I mean, I watched, uh, you know, last year I, I saw televisions that were the width of a piece of paper and can flutter in the breeze. Like, I mean, you get to see some amazingly cool stuff. And I think that's also part of why we go. Um, obviously there's, there's business to be had and business to be done, but getting to see and experience these cutting edge things. Uh, I think at heart, we are a software company, a technology company, uh, and we have a passion for it. So I think we get to nerd out a little bit while we're there too, which is fun for us. So obviously we miss out on the live events because of everything happening in the world today. And just knowing you you can't take and put 170,000 people in a confined space over a five day period. It's just, uh, it's not where we are from a safety perspective um, and a comfort level, I think for a lot of companies. So everything went virtual this year with a lot of intention. And I think a lot of planning, Uh, I don't think it took any less time to get anything prepared uh, in a virtual space as it did in a physical space. Um, So they put together a virtual conference this year to try to provide that same experience. We want to talk a little bit about what we saw from a virtual uh, event or conference platform um, so that we can try to talk through some of the pros and cons, because uh, I think they were both both sides of, of, of that discussion to be had. Uh, let's start a little bit with the functionality and the features of the conference, maybe things we saw that we liked, things that we maybe thought we could have uh, could have been a better experience, perhaps, um, and perhaps things that we would uh, look to the future of what we, we might have learned from that conference. So, um, Daniel, I'll let you kind of kick off with maybe a couple things you saw, and then we can kind of go back and forth on that. Yeah, I think we've alluded to a few different um, conferences that we've gone to this year. And and one thing that stuck out with me uh, immediately was after I registered for the event, um, in the past, other events, I've that was kind of the end of it. You registered and you waited for the conference to come. And what this, what CES did, which engaged me instantly was it put me into a, basically, you know, a built schedule of keynote speakers and events and, you know, people who had registered and signed up and allowed me to start to configure my experience. So when I talk about my experience, it was the ability to select things and add them to my schedule, the ability to 
look at vendors that I was interested in seeing in their space or, you know, customers of ours that we work with that I want to stop by and, and touch base on their new products, was able to add that to my show right away and start to configure my experience. Um, and I thought that was that was helpful and kept me engaged and excited. And it also made me kind of know that, hey, it, I'm not just waiting till, you know, January 5th um, or the 8th, whatever the date was, I can't remember now, the 8th, I think it was. Um, but I can go in there and check who, what's been added and, and, and um, what's going on. So that, I think, you know, not a super complicated feature, but something that got me interested in CES ahead of time, which typically um, in, a, in an average year, and when, you know, throughout this, I'm going to compare normal CES to, to my experience. This is, I usually spend the month of December working with customers and planning my show and who I'm going to see, what new customer, you know, what potential customers I'd like to see, current customers I'd like to, you know, have a drink with, have a coffee with, have breakfast with, whatever that is. Um, so it was nice to still have that experience where I could, I could configure that, you know, that week for myself. Yeah, I thought the lead up uh, offered you a lot of opportunities to help prepare yourself and kind of engage in, in the conference before the conference even begins, which I think builds momentum into going coming into the event. Uh, one of the things that I I really liked and I have not seen from a lot of other conferences is um, on the main page, there was, uh, lack of a better way of putting it, I think they call it the anchor desk, but uh, sort of a news show. Uh, and it was it was a nice visual digest of what's happening at the show. How do we keep people informed um, of what's what's going on and what is ultimately a very large uh, environment that you can easily get kind of lost or confused by, I think, uh, just based on the scale. I, I thought that was a nice thing. Now, maybe not everyone has the ability to have a, a full-on set of three anchor duos to run a live show all, all of the time. Um, but even something uh, simple, and we'll talk about this kind of throughout as well, is um, what would we uh, recommend doing? I liked the idea of having even a, a text-based digest of what's happening or a, a recap, uh, a, a summary of the day, if you will, or, or even a conversation or discussion of you know, what was coming out of the keynote, some highlights, uh, key phrases, whatever it might be. Um, I thought that was a nice way to keep people up to date on things if they weren't able to attend every session, or maybe they were attending a conflicting session, and they needed to come in and uh, just kind of hear what happened. I thought that was a really nice way to keep people tied to the event on a daily basis. Yeah, I think, you know, that's a good cue into kind of Features and functionalities from a, uh, a virtual perspective. I don't know if this falls into that category specifically, but you talk about the anchor desk. I think that in anything we do online, if the, a blog, a YouTube video, a, a TikTok, a Instagram, whatever, whatever, anything we consume online or digitally, the content is always king, right? The, the content that we consume is going to drive the experience. So it was nice to see... Um, the effort level that went into and the production value that went into like the anchor desk. And I thought that that live commentary on, on some, you know, pre-recorded sessions was great. I thought that the production value on panelist sessions and um, the keynotes were great as well. And that I think, you know, drove me to keep going through the environment because virtual environments can get, you know, laggy and they can get, you know, they cause you to be disinterested and they can get tired. And as an attendee, you can get fatigued. So I thought the content was really good. Um, and you know, it's, it's virtual and it's a, it's technology. So there's always going to be a blip here or there. So when the content's good, it really keeps you engaged. Yeah. And I think, look, we, we should acknowledge the fact that some of the stuff wasn't ideal. Uh, and from a functionality and features perspective, um, there was some, some gaps in some of that as well. Uh, I think, when you're, I do think the production value and the arrangement of sessions was was really good, and I liked the fact that I could build out my own personal agenda, right? So I liked the fact there was choice, um, and there there were multiple sessions happening at once, and and things like that. I didn't think that the experience of finding and engaging with the the vendors or the manufacturers and the participants in the exhibitor hall was everything I would have hoped it was. I thought it was a little hard to find the people I wanted to connect with uh, or the people that might have the greatest um, interaction value for, for us as a company or for me as an individual. Um, I thought that was a little lacking um, and just a little confusing. The reality is there were still, uh, again, normal year we talk about it, 
Um, we did see a decline. So they normally see around 4,000 vendors. There were only about 1,900 that participated this year. Um, but that's still 1,900 vendors you're trying to, to figure out um, who has the right presence. And um, look, some of the exhibitors were people that were like us. And so, you know, you want to be able to try to figure out who you can actually have that that conversation to drive some business. And I thought that was a little, a little clunky, um, a, a lot of volume though. Right. So, you know, not to discredit what was, what was the work. I just think that could have been a little cleaner. Yeah. I think on the, on the vendor note, and I just want to comment on this because you, you talked about the numbers and this is something that you and I spoke about um, and spoke with our team greater on basically the attendance from a vendor perspective and the attendee perspective was cut in half. Um, yep. And I know you and I don't know that why that is right now, but I'm sure over the course of uh, 2021, in conversations with clients, um, you know, acquaintances in the space, uh, friends, coworkers, I think we're going to learn. Um, and I think that as we just go into virtual as a whole and we continue down the path um, that yeah, we are on, um, we're going to start to understand what's going to really get people to these virtual conferences because 50% cut in attendees when really... It's more wildly, widely available. You don't have to get on a plane. You don't have to get a hotel room, which by the way, for CES, it's extremely difficult. Um, and it's just a question of why people didn't participate. So, and like I said, the number of people who were there, 70,000 plus, that was, the, it's the largest virtual event I've seen this year. Uh, 1,900 participating vendors. It's the largest amount of vendors I've seen in a virtual event this year or, or heard. So there, there is a big question there. And going back to the vendor experience, I think... A little bit of the fee from the functionality perspective, some of the awe that you get when you walk through the halls of CES are, uh, Scott mentioned the big waving TV and the LG booth, but not even that. When you walk through the healthcare section and you see, you know, the prototype robots that they have that are, they're, they're starting to use in hospitals and, and different things that are going on, or you walk by a random booth that's not that big and, and um, there's a crowd of like 150 people around it or 200 people around it. And you're just like, what, what's going on over there? And you walk over there and, and I, I don't really know how to capture that, um, in a virtual space and that, that, uh, spontaneity per se with the, with the environment and the vendor side of it, but it really lacked that. And I think it's a big part of it. I know, I know with like, I've been going to CES now for seven years. Some of our colleagues in the, in the space have been going to CES for, for 25, 30 years, but I know one of my favorite parts about CES or when, you know, new Halite employees or Halite employees go to the event for the first time. And then we we go have dinner at night and they're just like, oh, I saw this and I saw that. And this was so cool and this and that. And so um, it lacked that a little bit this year. And I think if they were to reflect and think about doing a digital and in-person conference in 2022, hopefully that's possible uh, in person. If it's not, I think I'm gonna go crazy. Um, that they'll, they'll think about how to enhance that experience a bit more. So I'm sure we could have talked about fun functionality features of the event a little bit about just, I mean, we could probably go on about that for days. Uh, it was, it was a, a lot going on. We did talk about the fact that uh, I think Daniel mentioned there were around 70,000 participants, which is crazy. Um, but it is low. Um, when you think about normally 170, 180,000 people, we're, we're talking about a third of the participants overall, about half the vendors in the show. Um, so it's a really, uh, there's a lot going on there that we could sit and unpack for days. Uh, we're not going to do that though. Uh, we, we only have so much time on the podcast. We don't want to lose our audience. So, um, but I do want to talk about keynotes and I thought keynotes was something that was really different when we talk about virtual versus live. Um, I think there were things that went really well, things that were maybe a little uh, off here as well. But uh, overall, I think the keynotes for me was the highlight of CES. Um, and I, I, what I mean by that is uh, we've probably all gone to either a professional conference or if you've been to CES or something like that. It, honestly, I, I knew there were keynotes, but getting to them was always... Uh, not a priority, I guess, if, if you think about it in that sense. And it was either because it was, look, it's it's all the way across town and then there are, it's at eight o'clock in the morning. And you know, I, do I really want to try to figure out how to get there? Do I want to navigate all the traffic? Whatever, right? So physically getting to a keynote is always a little bit of a, a stretch unless it happens to be happening in the, the ballroom of the hotel you're in or something. Um, for any of these events, that's always a tough one. Also, it's like, eh, do I really, do I know that person? Am I going to be inspired by that person? Um and, you know, is that enough of a motivator to make me physically go? 
the keynotes at a virtual event are super easy to attend, right? They're, they're there. They're already available. Um, they're happening on the main area and it's just a click away, right? It's, it's not, uh, any kind of an ordeal to logistically figure out how to get to them. So I thought it was much easier to attend keynotes, which I think was a great advantage to this, that you got to hear uh, every speaker uh, going throughout the conference and not have to like pick and choose like, oh, I know I've got to get to that building now. And, you know, the next one starts in two hours. Am I going to have enough time to get there, get lunch and see something along the way? This was very easy to consume. I thought that part was great. I also thought it was just front and center, which made it much easier as well. Um, so for me, the key, keynotes themselves were a highlight of CES. We'll talk, I'm sure, a little bit about which ones we liked and some of the things we saw that we wanted to do. But uh, that was my takeaway. Keynotes were sort of the highlight of CES this year, which I don't think historically has been probably the perspective many would have. Yeah, I know that. Um, I think I've I've gone to two panels, you know, two fireside chat kind of panels, um, maybe one or two keynotes uh, over my six or seven years. It's not the reason why I'm there. Um I also think that the content of the keynotes this year was different. Um, and I think it was um, different because they knew, you know, that th th it was going to be the focal point. And I think there was a lot more um, relevant content that wasn't just like new product launches. Let's talk about this technology. Let's talk about that technology. Um, there was a lot of conversation about, you know, how companies, have gotten here, how they've gotten through 2020, where the, where they think the world is going, how they can continue to innovate to, you know, make it a better place. Um, and, and I thought that was great. And I think for us, there was a lot of things that related directly to us. I mean, uh, things in the retail space. I, I know that the future of education was a, was a big um, conversation that we enjoyed um, understanding the modern consumer were a lot, you know, a lot of things that, that uh, I love to engage with. So I think that, seeing those become a focal point. I mean, I love keynotes. I love information. I, I try to consume it, blogs, videos, things like that. And, and that's what this was. So I, I enjoyed the the different keynotes and I thought they were very well done. I thought the speakers were engaging uh, for the most part. And um, it, 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 there were moments that got me excited about, you know, 2021 and some other. Yeah. And look, you had, uh, we'll kind of outline really fast, just what, what was the layout of keynotes? Um, you had sort of, I'll break them down into a few different buckets, if you will. And I think the first was more of uh, what we'd call a show opener or a show stopper sometimes, but these large scale main stage events. Um, and those were still in production and we still had those uh, large production value, a lot of, uh, you know, heavy graphics and really cool stuff. Now, the cool part about a virtual event is those environments were very large and immense and the, the person could move through space and time in a lot of ways, uh, which was really cool from a production value that you probably wouldn't normally see from someone who's physically standing on a main stage in an auditorium. Um, the other thing I saw with those is guests. So typically, I think when you think of a keynote like that, maybe they bring someone on stage or whatever, but we had, you know, uh, the, the opening session was the CEO from Verizon, right? And he had Roger Goodell from the NFL. He had Deion Sanders, former NFL player. He had uh, the director of the Smithsonian. Like these people came on and off screen uh, all the time, whether he was talking to him via a camera in a simulated look, all of it was simulated. We should also be very clear. Very little was done live. I can't blame them. A lot of streaming had to happen. Um, but you have that opportunity to really kind of put some kind of movie or television style production to some of those things, which I thought was cool. Uh, you also had keynotes that were more fireside chat. Uh, more one-on-one -on -one conversational interview style. Um, for me, my favorite keynote of the session was uh, Corey Berry from Best Buys. Uh, and it was very personal. It was very um, small. It was just her and an interviewer. Um, and it was really cool to hear the way Best Buy has had some success in what have been some very challenging times. Um, it was very informative, but it was also very personal. I liked that part of it for me. That was one of my key takeaways was um, it doesn't always have to be speaking to the masses. Sometimes it, it felt more like it was a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Uh, I liked that experience. Um, and then I think the last, which is uh, maybe not keynote driven, but uh, very conference driven was more of these panels. So an interviewer or a moderator with two or three people contributing on a, on a single topic. Um, and those were more in like a Zoom style conference. Um, I thought those resonated well with just the world we live in. Um, 
and, and we're, it was technology we're all very familiar with using. Um, I, th- I liked the fact that I could pick and choose there on topics that I was very interested in. So um, I thought they were all really, really, really well done. I thought it was a different focus than CES typically has. And I was glad we had the opportunity to kind of listen to some some leaders in the industry on those topics. Yeah, I would I would say that uh, Corey Berry was definitely probably my favorite keynote. Um, I obviously we we work with Best Buy quite a bit, and um, so there's always an interest there. But the the biggest thing that the biggest shift. I mean, we're talking about a a brick and mortar retailer who has, unlike a lot of their peers who have gone out of business over the past twenty years has sustained and been able to combat um, the likes of Amazon and just on e-commerce in general. And and I think that keynote um, showed me why. And I know that she just took over um, and she's the former CEO and, or, uh, sorry, CFO. Um, but hearing her talk about they don't, as, as a Best Buy, that they aren't worried about where their customers get the product they just want to make sure that they have the best customer experience as possible and talked about online and Kurt and, you know, the addition of curbside pickup now and, and in store and, and whatever that experience the customer wants, they're willing to now, you know, mold themselves and deliver it. And I found that to be really interesting personally. Um, but also, um, like you mentioned, I, I think it was a very personal chat. On the other hand, there was, there was another chat that I, I really enjoyed um, and I know that some of our, our coworkers really enjoyed it as well. Um, with some of them, um, it was a CMO chat and, uh, the CMO of, of Mattel and, and Barbie was on and some others. And, and, uh, it was very interesting chat. Just, I'm a marketing, uh, geek. That's my background. That's my education. I love it. I love digital marketing, social media, and like hearing them talk about the different campaigns and like hearing the, the C, the CMO of Barbie as a whole talk about like their content plan and how they've you know, Barbie's always been a real life figure to, to kids, but now like the ability to have, you know, little short animations on YouTube and on TikTok and, um, you know, the fact that they have a Barbie podcast coming out and like having to figure out who's going to be the voice of Barbie now, like um, all these different content plans, I find it really, really interesting. And it's no, you know, it's, it's, it's not so removed from the things that we're trying to do at Haylight for our brand, um, but hearing the way they're doing it for their brand, I found it to be really interesting as well. And look, at, at the heart, this podcast is all about learning and development, right? So uh, if you've stuck with us this long, normally listening for a certain kind of content, I don't want to leave you completely hanging. But a couple of the notes we've had here apply to learning. So one of them that you just mentioned is this differentiator to think differently in, in modalities. And look, we'll spend time on that in one of our sessions, I'm sure. But um, I'm seeing some really kind of cool stuff and ideas on ways to utilize social media or those formats and platforms to create content and think about it that way. You mentioned Corey Berry and her, that, that the, the, the thing that resonated was a lot of adaption and adaptability in Best Buy's uh, approach to selling in the pandemic. And I think that same notion goes to learning and development as well. We'll talk again, ad nauseum, I'm sure this season about a lot of topics that are like this, but listen to the learner and, and adjust. And that was the message I took away from the way we run our businesses. Um, we can get really stuck in like, oh, this is the way learning happens. But the reality is it's shifting and it does change. And you have to have that focus that it's really about the cons- the customer, which in our case, in our industry is the learner and listening to what they want, how they're changing, what their needs are, and, and trying to deliver on that, not necessarily just deliver on the way you've always done it or the way you believe it needs to happen. Um, so I think those were takeaways that I took back home in, in the way I'll do my job differently from those conversations as well. Um, so there's your uh, small connection, if nothing, but back to the learning and the actual po- uh, topic of the podcast uh, for those that stuck with us this long. No, I think I think uh, just to add to that, Scott, I think I'll, I'll start 2021 the way I uh, operated holistically during 2020. I think using Corey Berry's keynote as the example, she continued to go back to what their mission is, or in, in the case of a, a learning or, or, or training, what the objectives are of their company. High level, right? Like, we want to deliver, you know, technology to our consumer. I don't know their exact mission statement. I can't recall, but uh, off the top of my head, but like that was it, like delivering technology or ma- I think it's making people's lives easier through technology or something like that. And she kept going back to that every single time, right? So if, if they go back to their mission and their objective, right, it doesn't matter what they build. Um, 
You know what I mean? It, it, it doesn't matter how they deliver it to people. Same thing with your content. If, if you have an objective in your content and your consumer being your, the person you're training wants to consume it a certain way, that's how it should be delivered to them. You know, there's obviously caveats and things that go there, but I think it's, you know, everything you said is true, Scott, and it can follow that same sort of like that model. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, one of the biggest advantages of CES. And again, Daniel referenced it in, in terms of why Halite comes, but it's why everyone comes. We're all trying to meet someone we can ultimately do business with, whatever that is, um, whether you're someone who's a merchant trying to buy product for you to sell as a retailer, whether you are a manufacturer who's trying to sell said product, if you are someone in more of a support function who needs to is looking to provide software security or learning and development or a marketing campaign, um, we're all looking to connect with people. That's the goal of CES. Um, and I'm sure we're going to dive into this a lot. So uh, I know, Daniel, like this is a big part of the sales aspect of your role. So I'll let you kick off with sort of your first takes on what networking was like. What did you dislike? What did you like? What was the accomplishment? What did you find was the takeaway from your experience? Yeah, I'm going to um, create a theory here. Because I had some brief conversations, like we said, I think we're going to figure out why the attendance was down, but I don't know if we were on day two or day three and I kind of, we had our group chat of everybody who was attending and we were talking about things we liked, things we didn't like, things we saw. And I kind of, I kind of put it out there that I felt, I didn't feel the same like buzz for the event that I typically do. I mean, as a salesperson and um, in those I, I love networking and I love business conversations and strategy conversations and that. So when I'm at CES, like, I feel like I'm thriving. Like, I feel like I'm just living my best life and I'm just in, in my best moment. And I feel like that was taken away from me in CES this year when it came to like networking and, and introducing myself. So I'll use the example. I messaged some people through the way you could, could message. Now, listen, it, it was, you could search pretty much anybody on the platform and allowed to make yourself public. So that was great. You could search them by company. You could filter through it. You could send anybody messages, which was, which was awesome. So I was able to find some people that we used to work with who had moved on to different opportunities and reach out. And a lot of their responses were the same. You know, um, hey, here's my email. Send me an email. Hey, follow me on LinkedIn. Do this. And we'll connect outside of here. And it kind of took away from that, that CES connection of it. Um, so that was tough. And, and we've talked about this before when it comes to virtual events. The, the networking and connections portion of the event is the state, thing I still don't have my finger on of like how that's, that can be recreated digitally for so it's spontaneous. Because, I mean, there, we've, we've got customers at Haylight who we were standing in line for whatever and chatting. And all of a sudden, like we started building relationships and six months later, we're doing business together or we have a partnership on something. And that that wasn't there. So it, um, not to be a downer on, on CS, because I think overall, I would say CS was a successful event to take that, that digitally. I think that that was the part that a lot of the people like us who are service providers or use this time to strategize are going to take away from it that like, Hey, um, it le it left us asking for more. And, um, that, that's my big takeaway on the networking side of things. Yeah, I have, I have kind of two thoughts. And the first one is immediacy. So when you think about a live event, uh, you, you mentioned like waiting in line at the coffee shop or, you know, standing in line to watch an exhibit or even sitting next to someone at a keynote, like you randomly bump into people, you make connections. But when you're live at CES, you get those five days to A, collect contact, contacts, but that's your chance to meet face-to-face -face live interaction. Obviously, 2020 has shifted our, our view of meeting face-to-face. -face. Uh, and so I think we, we understand there's there's still a way to have that dialogue. But for the most part, you're there. You're physically in person. You want to sit down and have a coffee or grab lunch or even just, you know, give me five minutes in a vendor hall. Uh, let's just chat about what your goals are and what your objectives are. You have that immediacy. I need to meet with you now because this is the opportunity. When it's virtual like this, to your point, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Email me. We'll get to it next month. Or email me. Yeah, we got time. Like, I think it takes away from that. Now, I don't know what, to your point, I strategizing on how you bring that back to life, uh, I don't know. Um, and it is going to be a miss as long as we're in a virtual world versus a live. Recreating that, that ability to bump into someone and say, now's the chance for us to chat. 
I think is really tough. Um, I think it's also easy to get distracted by the, the world going around you. you. You've still got work happening. As much as we tried to put as much focus on just doing those things for CES for those two or three days, um, it's stu- still super easy to have the kids trying to do remote schooling in the background or a phone call comes in from your doctor or um, you, you know, your spouse or significant other needs you to run and, and just change the laundry over and all of a sudden you're distracted again. So I think there's a lot of ways to get distracted in that moment and you know not, not maybe see the immediacy when you're, we've talked about captive audiences at a live event uh, before. When you're there, that's what you were doing and it was so much easier to focus on that. The other thing... Um, from the networking perspective, I was talking with someone and, and they described this event. Uh, let's, let's quick, sorry, I'll, I'll backtrack. Live event, we talked about 170,000 people sprawled across Vegas and there's people everywhere. You feel part of a community that is doing that, right? Even if you don't know the people you're standing next to, even if you don't talk to the people you're standing next to, you're part of the event. You're part of the motion, the movement, and the flood of people that are everywhere. And you feel a part of this connection to individuals. CES this year, uh, as was described to me in part of the the conversation I was having, they're like, this was a lonely event. And it was. It was you sitting at your desk, interacting with a screen, hoping to get somebody to stand next to you, but you physically can't. So it was trying to get that person to reach out, have a message, have a connection. And again, a lot of it was just pushing people off. And so you were experiencing it in a void. Now, with that being said, one of the other great highlights for me was uh, the fact that we were still a team attending this event. So we started up a, a Teams chat uh, that we had running through the entire event, and we would sit and we'd watch con- uh, the keynotes, or we would be going around to the vendor halls, and we were sharing pictures, and we were we were talking as a team. Now, granted, that's not networking. I'm not learning and connecting with new people, but at least I had a connection point. And I, so the reflection point I had was, imagine you're someone who didn't have that team connecting with them, at least your own business partners. If you were someone who was solo in this in this venture, that was an incredibly lonely experience where you weren't able to connect with the people at the event uh, in a really great way. I thought that was, it's a miss, but it's not a miss that is a knock on CES. It is a miss that I'm seeing from all virtual conferences where it's very hard to connect with people. Um, and Again, we had that connection point, that tie-in. We were sharing jokes and telling stories and sharing really cool things we saw. And I thought that was a great anchor point for us to be more connected and have conversation. But we've got to figure that out from virtual conferences on what is the way to get people connected, get them involved, and get them talking uh, if we're ever going to try to recreate some of that live networking uh, experience. And I think that's really important. Uh, for a lot of what's happening. Yeah, and I think you, I think you mentioned it. Like the 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 concept of we is is not we as Haley. I think it's everybody involved in digital. And I I one hundred percent agree. It's if if it's an all digital event next year, like it's going to have less attendees than it did this year. It's just I think that's just the reality of the situation. So um, overall, I I think that the networking side of it is something that it can be improved on, and, and something that we we talk about very frequently and. And I think that that everybody would be willing to, you know, provide feedback and and engage with each other on how it could be better and how the spontaneity could have come back and how um, all that, you know, could be put together. I do want to mention one more thing because, you know, we're I spend a lot of my time at these events talking to current um, customers or or leads. Um, we do send our sales team in guns a blazing to these events because there are a lot of potential customers for us. So. Um, we apologize um, that we're sometimes can be the annoying salespeople, but hey, a situation that is matched in an intensity level or an energy level. So, you know, it is a lot easier. We all know the term for the keyboard warriors. It's a lot easier to send a cold email, to send a cold message through a chat on the CS platform than it is to walk into a booth and talk to somebody. Um, it takes a little bit more courage, not to say that we can't do it, but it, it, you have to, there's like that little like pep talk you give yourself like, okay, I'm going to go do this. And then you go because you're just walking in and looking for a random person in, in reverse. It's a lot, the energy levels are matched. It is a lot easier to ignore a message that you get sent anonymously from some person you don't know. It's a lot more difficult to get out of a per, in-person conversation or not at least listen to their introduction and do all of that. And um, from that, I thought that that experience was, was matched, but the more that they, that energy level of the networking can match what is in person, 
of, hey, I need to go have a meaningful conversation. I can't just copy and paste an email into or a message into this chat. Um, I, I think it's going to create a better experience for everybody because the reality of it is like we're selling a product. And yeah, we're, we're, we're selling. But I've, we have never sold our product to someone who didn't need it. And that's what's found out. And we, we have closed business and brought a new business because of walking randomly into booths at CS. So um, I'd like to see more of that. And so our, you know, our sales team can have a more interactive and engaging experience with potential customers. But um, I guess that's, that's, you know, future outlook. Yeah. Uh, and that is part of that human interaction, I think. And we saw it too. So if you want to see the manifestation of how the site morphs to the way the business or the attendees wanted it to go, the chat functionality that was available within the platform quickly devolved from Daniel and I talking about a cool experience we had, hypothetically, as just two random attendees, and instead was small vendors who are trying to get their product noticed, get people to attend their booth and experience their message, were resorting to what I called Twitter marketing, which is essentially 146 characters of, please come visit our booth, posted every three minutes. Like that was what the chat devolved to. It was less dialogue, less conversation, and just please come to our booth. And if you're looking for, I don't know, battery chargers or phone cases or uh, HDMI cords or LED technology or whatever it was, it was just please come talk to us, please come talk to us, please come talk to us. Which when you go live to in a show, those individuals are standing in a booth trying to pull you in in the same way that we as salespeople were trying to go in to try to get them to talk to us. They're also trying to get merchants and other folks to come into their booth, experience their product and get recognized and hopefully make sales themselves. So I, that was just a, a miss there as well as how do you give that vendor experience a little love? Uh, Cause these folks are out there trying to, to connect and, and make the right business arrangements. So um, we saw the site itself manifest itself a little bit in that way, which I thought was also an interesting social sociology experiment too, maybe, but all right, we've been going on and on. Uh, hopefully this has been at least fun. It's been fun for us to talk about and kind of recap uh, what we've seen. One of the things I think we need to just take away, we've probably given you a whole bunch is do we have one maybe tip or, or trick uh, lesson learned, if you will, for me, Daniel and I on what we think is the most important thing coming out of this event that you can maybe action on right away. So I know we talked a lot about networking and how that has to evolve and become better. Um, but is there one thing that we would recommend you do that is available to you today when you think about setting up your uh, a virtual event or a virtual conference that we took away from CES? Um, I'll go first because uh, I don't want to put Daniel on the spot with uh, as I'm shifting the, the direction of our notes. Um, for me, it's about personalization. The, the most impactful things I saw today wasn't high production value, although those things were cool. It wasn't about speaking to the masses. I think the more you can make the conversation one on one uh, in your delivery, even on pre recorded things, uh, the things I saw that were uh, the most impactful for me was someone who recorded a message that made it feel like it was speaking to me directly. I think if you can think about those interactions, one, it helps relieve that kind of loneliness. You're not just talking into the ether, you're talking to me as an individual. Try to frame your scripting, your message, your content that way. I think that would make this con any conference, not just CES, any conference a little bit more personal, a little bit more individualized, and I might feel a bit more connected to the experience. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to piggyback on the concept of personalization, Scott, but I'm going to go with um, the way you can chop up a show schedule and, and an event and make it your own. Obviously digital, like we mentioned, there's a larger potential audience. And also there's also an opportunity to have a larger slew of content because you don't need, you don't need 20 breakout rooms to run 20 concurrent sessions. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of content. Can we offer that content up to people who really need it or really want it or based upon what they provided to you in their um, information? or in their profile, you kind of configure that environment. I think it goes back to a concept that we've mentioned briefly in, in other podcasts, like of adapted learning, right? Of can the environment be adapted to who is attending it? So it is a more um, experience because if I can get, if it's an eight hour a day conference and there's keynotes that I want to watch and, and speakers and sessions the whole time, um, if there's a, if there's an 
hour long or a 45 minute long keynote in the middle that doesn't apply to me at all, I'm going to tune out. And whether I come back, that I may be done for the day. I may get on another task. I may get in a call into a meeting and do whatever. So I think being able to personalize the experience is close to everything that you want and desire as an attendee. I think that would be massive. All right. It wouldn't be one of our podcasts if we didn't end up uh, uh, the show with a little bit of a positivity point, uh, bring a little something exciting and energetic to the uh, to the world and share that with our audience. Uh, Daniel, I'll let you go first today. Happy Happy New Year. Uh, we'll do something fun today. I mean, I was going to I was going to say that I finally cleaned my desk, which is typically a mess, but uh, uh, my desk is clean. So that's a big deal. But no, my, my positivity point is 2020. And I, I ended the year last year on this note that there was actually a lot of positive thinking that came from me in 2020. Obviously, my daughter, but some other things. Um, but I got some time to really work on me. And I've continued that. So I was just talking to, to Sabrina and Scott before this, you know, the recording started, but uh, really focused on health and fitness, held my health and wellness. Um, getting back healthy, uh, maybe getting myself back to when I was an athlete, uh, who knows, but uh, I've been spending a lot of time exercising, eating better, um, and uh, watching that side of things. Um, I'm also in this like 50-50 weight loss competition with an old trainer I worked out with, had to you know pay to enter, so I'm a little bit motivated. So I'll keep you updated if I win that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm just, I'm just excited. My positivity point is I really spent time on, on my health and wellness and my wife is on the journey with me and we're doing it together. So it's something we do every night, which is uh, super motivating. So I'm, it's, it's really uplifting and I'm feeling better. It's been a, a few weeks now, obviously, and I'm, I am really feeling better. So it's, it's, it's awesome. That's outstanding. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, my positivity point runs the risk of us alienating some of our audience. So I apologize ahead of time, but um, my wife uh, is from Wisconsin and I have adopted a, a a temporary love. Now I am an Arizona Cardinals fan, uh, as my primary team, but we didn't make the playoffs. So, uh, my wife is a huge Packers fan. Uh, she lived, uh, not too far away. Dad had season tickets, I think at one point, um, huge Packer family, obviously anyone from Wisconsin knows how that goes. Uh, so we're just loving the fact they're in the playoffs. They look real solid. Um, personally, I think Aaron Rodgers is one of, one of, if not the best quarterback to have ever played. If you want to see someone having a good time, Go find uh, Rodgers smirking at the safety as he's about to burn him for a 70-yard touchdown from last week. Uh, it's pretty remarkable to watch uh, him see what he sees and know he's just got himself a touchdown. Um, but uh, just enjoying the playoffs in general. I love that football's back. Um, I, just in general, uh, I think this has been a, a, a an interesting year in the NFL. I'm glad we made it all the way through. Um, and looking forward to, to yelling Go Pack Go a lot this Sunday or uh, this weekend and then hopefully in the Super Bowl. So, um, that's really for me. Uh, just some, some love of some sports. Also, I beat Daniel in fantasy football championships. So just wanted to throw that in there. Uh, oh, he made the whole, ah! and then he threw it out there. Oh, good. Put, yeah. Stick the knife in a little bit there at the end. I, I, I couldn't pass that up. I did. I did make it. Uh, yeah, it was, it was an epic, uh, epic showdown at the very end there between Daniel and I, and, uh, I, I took it home. We'll, we'll send a picture of the ring. So, just to twist it in a little further. That will do it for us today. I'm Scott Babcock. He's Daniel Mendonca. But one last special note. Season 2 is right around the corner. We are starting February 11th. Uh, look for new episodes coming out weekly starting that date. We will talk to you then. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you for listening to another episode of the If You Build It, Will They Learn podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Join the conversation by emailing us at podcast at haylight.com. Find us on social media at Build It, Learn It, and be sure to check us out on the web at www.haylight.com. That's H-A-L-I-G-H-T dot com.